Welcome to the Ultimate Sports Podcast. Today is Monday, April 15, 2019. Long weekend to go over. NBA playoffs, Stanley Cup playoffs, baseball. I'll do my power rankings, pick players of the week, do my latest NFL mock draft with the draft being 10 days away, a rumor involving a star NFL quarterback, some coaching news in the NBA, and my best bet. But we have to start what is probably the biggest story, perhaps of the sports year so far. The winner of the 2019 Masters, Tiger Woods. It's funny, two, three years ago, I thought Tiger was washed, and he wouldn't be the same anymore after all the injuries he suffered, and he struggled a few years back. And now he's back. He wins the Masters with a minus 13, earns $2.1 million. This is a huge win for sports, huge win for the game of golf. And he's already favored to win the PGA Championship. And what a story. I'm very happy for Tiger and his family. He had a great tournament. And I'm looking forward to seeing how the rest of his year goes after last year. Oh, coming oh so close a couple times. And winning a couple small tournaments but nothing major. But this is major. Winning the 2019 Masters is a big deal. His first Masters win since 2005. His first major win since 2008. His fifth green jacket. Unbelievable. Second place was a three-way tie, each earning $858,000. Xander Shoffley, Dustin Johnson, and Brooks Kepka all with the minus 12. Fifth place, you had Tony Fiu, tied with Jason Day. And Wayne Simpson, all with the score of minus 11, as well as Francis Malarney, John Rahm, and Ricky Fowler were tied with ninth with one other person with the minus 10. 12th place was a big tie among the notables Justin Thomas and Bubba Watson, all with the minus 8. Phil Nicholson was tied for 18th with a minus 6. Disappointing tournament for Rory McIlroy with the minus five. That's who a lot of people thought would win this tournament. Jordan Spieth was also a minus five, tied in with McIlroy and a couple others for 21st place. Some other notables in here. Sergio Garcia was cut, which that's a disappointment for him. And tied for 58th place with a plus 5, Zach Johnson. So disappointing Masters for him. I am very looking forward to the PGA Championship, which is from May 16th to May 19th. Next weekend is the RBC Heritage. Now up, we'll do the NBA Playoffs. The scores from Saturday and Sunday and look ahead to tonight's games. Nets over to 76 was 111-102 in Game 1. Brooklyn has a 1-0 series lead. D'Angelo Russell was sensational. He had 26 points. Joe Harris had 13. Damari Carroll had 11. Spencer Dinwiddie had 18 off the bench. Carroll Silver had 23 off the bench. Ronte Hellas Jefferson didn't see any playing time. That's to me, something that Kenny Atkinson should explore. I think Hollis Jefferson is talented, but you got to play your best guys to win. I get that. Ned Davis had a surprise impact in this game. He had 12 points. Moving on for Philly, Jimmy Butler had a great game, 36 points and 9 boards. John Bede was playing, 22 points, 15 boards. Tobias Harris had a disappointing game, 4 points on 2 for 7 shooting. Off the bench, Bojan Marjanovic had 13 points. Big game two tonight, which we'll preview and pick in a couple of moments. Magic over the Raptors, 104-101. Orlando has a 1-0 series lead. The big shot in this game was by DJ Augustine that gave them the three-point lead in the final seconds of the game. Augustine had 25 points total. Aaron Gordon had 10. Jonathan Isaac and Nikola Vucevic in their playoff debuts each had 11. Evan Fournier had 16. His first playoff game since when he was with the Nuggets back in 2013 before 
he was traded to Orlando for Aaron Oflalo. Michael Carter-Williams and Tyson Ross each had 10 off the bench. Pascal Siakam had 24. Kawhi Leonard had 25. Marcus Saw and Danny Green each had 13. The annual disappearance of Kyle Lowry continues. He had 0 points with 8 assists and 7 boards shadow for 7 from the field. And Fred Van Vliet had 14 for Toronto off the bench. So the loss of OG Anaby, hmm, maybe they missed him the other day. Warriors over to Clippers, 121-104. This game was close, and then they broke it open midway through the third as Golden State takes a 1-0 series lead. Stephen Curry was absolutely sensational. 38 points, 15 boards, 7 assists, 8 from 12 from 3-point land. Kevin Durant, 23 points, and got ejected along with Patrick Beverly for fighting and got the double technical and result of it. Draymond Green, 17 points, 7 assists, and 7 boards. He shot pretty well. Clay Thompson had 12. Their bench didn't even do anything. This was all Curry being Curry and the Clippers getting a little shaky there, which led to the Warrior fast break opportunities and open shots. Daniel Gallinari had 15. Shea Gilgis Alexander in his playoff debut at 18. Montrezl Harrell was sensational off the bench, 26 points and 5 boards. Lou Williams was good off the bench as well. He had 25. Jermichael Green had 10. Spurs over to Nuggets, 101-96, as they take a 1-0 series lead. DeMar DeRozan had 18 in his Spurs playoff debut. Derek White had 16. Bryn Forbes had 15. LaMarcus Aldridge had 15. Off the bench, Rudy Gay had 14. So they do decide to start purtling in one and bring Gay off the bench. So they go big to match Denver's bigs with Millsap and Jokic who combined with 22 points. Millsap at 12, Jokic had 10 along with his 14 boards and 14 assists. Jamal Murray had 17, Will Barnett had 15 with 10 boards. Gary Harris had 20. Off the bench, Malik Beasley had 10. So a disappointing debut for the Nuggets in this year's playoffs. Yesterday, the Celtics over the Pacers, 84-74 to take a one off in series lead. Indiana had a lead, and then Boston broke away in the second half. Indiana only scored eight points in the third quarter. Marcus Morris had 20. Al Horford had 10 with 11 boards. Jason Tatum had 15 off the bench. Marcus Morris had 20. Gordon Hayward had 10. We all for Indiana. Bojan Bogdanovic had 12, and off the bench, Corey Joseph had 14. The rest of the team really didn't do anything. Blazers over the Thunder, 104-99 to take a one out the series. It's a huge win for Portland. Damian Lillard was really good. 30 points in this game. Ennis Cantor, 20 points and 18 boards. CJ McCollum at 24. Alafrika Minu at 10. Bench didn't do anything. Meal off Oklahoma City. Russell Westbrook had 24, 10, and 10. Paul George had 26 with 10 boards. Steven Adams had 17 with 9 boards. And off the bench, Dennis Schroeder had 11. Bucks over to Pistons, 121-86. Milwaukee takes a 1-0 series lead. And disappointing for the Pistons because Blake Griffin is out for the series. I did not think that would be the case, but it is. So I think this will end up being a sweep. So I'm already regarding the Bucks in five selection by myself. Giannis Adetokounmpo is amazing. 24 points, 17 boards. Chris Middleton at 14 as well as Brooke Lopez. Eric Bledsoe at 15 Sterling Brown started in place of Malcolm Brogdon. He had 11. Off the bench, George Hill at 16. Nikola Meritich was shaky. He only had four points in his playoff Bucks debut. And then Pat Connington had 10 for the Bucks. We know for the Pistons, Andre Drummond and Reggie Jackson each had 12. And off the bench, Luke Kennard had 21. Rockets over the Jazz, 122-90. to Houston takes a 1-0 series lead. This was a resounding win for the Rockets. James Harden, 29 points. And 10 assists with 8 boards. Eric Gordon had 17. Chris Paul had 14. Clint Capella had 16 with 12 boards. And P.J. Tucker had 11. Off the bench, Kenneth Freed and Danielle House Jr. each had 11. Meanwhile, for Utah, Donovan Mitchell had 19. Rudy Gobert had 22 with 12 boards. Derek Favors had 13. Rookie Rubio had 15. Their bench didn't even do anything. Two games tonight. You have on TNT at 8 o'clock. The Nets at the 76ers. Philly's favored by a whopping 8.5. 
Joel Embiid will play. This has all the makings of the Philly blowout game two and shut everybody up about how they're soft and shut all the Nets optimists up about one good performance. So give me Philly to win by double digits. Brooklyn will be in it for three quarters, and I think those Philly bench for once will step up and put this game away in the fourth quarter. So give me Philly by a score of 120 to 108 final. Clippers and the Warriors, 10-30 TNT. Golden State's favored by 13.5. That was the same number they are favored by in Game 1. I believe on the call this game will be Marv Albert and Chris Webber. And the first game, I believe, will be, even though he works for Yes and is the voice of the Nets, this has to be Ian Eagle. Unless if Marv Albert does this game and Ian Eagle does Clippers-Warriors. But I'm sure Marv's doing Warriors. And I think Ian Eagle will do this game with maybe Greg Anthony or Grant Hill. And then Ryan Rucco and Sarah Kustak will be on the Yes Network tonight. This should be an interesting game in Golden State. I, one of my predictions for the first round was that the Clippers would come darn close to winning a game in Oracle Arena. I have a feeling this one's it. I think the Clippers will come out and play hard. As they did in Game 1. I just thought that Curry was ridiculous in Game 1. And that's why Golden State won by the margin they did. I do think Curry will have a good game. But I don't think he'll be scorching hot like he was in Game 1. In primetime on Saturday night. I think Golden State will win a very close one. And I think it will be more low scoring rather than high scoring. Well, low scoring for a Western Conference playoff game. So let's go 110-105 Warriors. Kevin Durant and Stephen Curry will put it away at the free throw line late. So Clippers cover the big number. We'll go to the Stanley Cup playoffs now where there are some interesting results from Saturday and Sunday. Capitals over the Hurricanes 4-3 in overtime. Washington takes a 2-0 series lead. First period, Nick Baskstrom, his third of the playoffs, 1-0 Caps. TJ Oshie's first of the playoffs, 2-0 Caps. With his first goal of the playoffs for the Hurricanes. Lucas Walmark puts Carolina on the board to make it a 2-1 game. Second period, Sebastian Aho late in the second period. Ties it up at two apiece. Third period, Tom Wilson puts the caps up 3-2. Jordan Stahl in the power play with five minutes to go in the court in the period. Ties it up at three apiece. And in overtime, a minute 48 in, Brooks Orpik gives the Capitals a 4-3 victory. He was the number one star of the game with that overtime goal. Number two star of the game with the goal and assist, Nick Backstrom. Number three star of the game with the goal, Jordan Stahl. Predators over to Stars, 2-1 in overtime. This was a fun game, too. The Stars actually took the lead early in the second period on a goal by Jamie Fenn, his first of the playoffs, 1-0 Stars. With the game-tying goal, they even it up at one apiece. Rocco Grimaldi, that was his first of the playoffs. And in overtime, Craig Smith with the game winner was just a lucky bounce that went behind Ben Bishop to give the Preds a much-needed 2-1 victory to to get the series back to Dallas. Number one star of the game with the overtime goal. Craig Smith, number two star of the game with the game tying goal for the Preds. Rocco Grimaldi, number three star of the game with 22 saves on 23 shots. Pekka Rene. Bruins over the Maple Leafs 4-1. The series tied at one apiece. Nazem Kadri had that big hit. And he's inevitably going to get suspended. Word has not come out yet. It might in the middle of me recording this podcast. This was all Bruins in this one. First period, Charlie Coyle is first of the playoffs. 1-0 Bruins. Brad Marchand's first of the playoffs. 2-0 Bruins. Second period, Daniel Heenan. 3-0 Bruins. Third period, Kadri actually scores in this one to make it a 3-1 game. And then Patrice Bergeron, second of the playoffs on the power play, gives... The Bruins a 4-1 lead and the win as they go back to Toronto, even up at one apiece. And if you're the Maple Leafs, you take the 1-1. And same for Dallas. 
And same for this next team I'm going to mention, the Colorado Avalanche, who are 3-2 winners over the Calgary Flames in overtime. First period, no goals were scored. Second period, a shorthanded goal was scored by Matt Nieto that gives the Avs a 1-0 lead. And then with a game-tying power play goal, Rasmus Anderson to tie that game up at 1. Third period, Sean Monaghan gives the Calgary Flames a 2-1 lead. JT Comfort ties it with less than three minutes to go to give it a tie game. That was his first of the playoffs. And then the overtime winner, his first of the playoffs, Nathan McKinnon, 3-2 abs, your final. McKinnon was the number two star of the game with a goal, but the number one star of the game with 36 saves on 39 shots was Mike Smith. Number two star of the game with two assists was Sam Bennett. Now, yesterday's games, Islanders over the Penguins 4-1 to give the Isles a shocking 3-0 series lead. The first goal of the game was actually scored by the Penguins. Garrett Wilson to put him up 1-0, and that was the only lead they're obviously going to have this game. Jordan Aperly started the playoffs, ties it up at one apiece. Brock Nelson, second of the playoffs, gives the Islanders a 2-1 lead. No goals in the second. Leo Komarov, first of the playoffs, gives the Isles a 3-1 lead. Then Anders Lee's first of the playoffs, gives the Isles a 4-1 lead. And that was your final. Number start of the game with 25 saves on 26 shots, Robin Leonard. Number two start of the game with a goal, Brock Nelson. Number three start of the game with a goal, Jordan Eberle. Blue Jackets over to Lightning, 3-1. Columbus has a 3-0 series lead. This is the most shocking development I've seen in the Stanley Cup playoffs in a long time. A dominant President's Trophy winning team down 0-3 in the first round is not something you would expect, but here we are. No goals in the first, but in the second period, his second of the playoff, Matt Shane gives the Blue Jackets a 1-0 lead. Oliver Brock stand on the power play, his first of the playoffs, 2-0 Columbus. Third period, Andre Palat, his first of the playoffs. Gives the Lightning a goal to get him within one. Then the empty netter by Cam Atkinson, his second of the playoffs, gives Columbus the 3-1 lead. And that is your final score. Number one star of the game with 30 saves on 31 shots, Sergei Bravovsky. Number two star of the game with a goal, Oliver Brogstan. And the number three star of the game didn't have a point, but just had a good game, Pierre-Luc Dubois. Jets over to Blues 6-3 to get within a game of the series. Much needed win for Winnipeg. This was a wild game. The Blues jump out to a 1 0 lead in the first period on a goal by David Perron, his second of the playoffs on the power play. 1 0 Blues. Second period. Here come the Jets. Kevin Hayes, first of the playoffs, 1 1. Patrick Lane, third of the playoffs, 2 1. Kyle Connors, first of the playoffs on the power play, 3 1. Jets. Third period. Blues get within a goal on the power play. Goal by Vladimir Tarasenko, his first of the playoffs, makes it 3 2. And then the Jets go up 4-2 on a goal by Brandon Tenev to make it a 4-2 game. Dustin Bufflin scores to make it 5-2. That was his first of the playoffs. Alexander Steen makes it 5-3, his first of the playoffs. And then Kyle Connor, his second of the playoffs, makes it 6-3 final. And that is now a series. Golden Knights over the Sharks, 6-3. As Vegas takes a 2-1 series lead. First period, 16 seconds in. Mark Stone, his fourth of the playoffs. 1-0 Vegas. Max Pacioretty, second of the playoffs on a power play. 2-0 Vegas. Kevin LeBanc's first of the playoffs. Gets the Sharks within one. Second period, Paul Stasny's first of the playoffs. Makes it 3-1 Vegas. Stasny again in the second period on a power play. 4-1 Vegas. Mark Stone, his fifth of the playoffs. Second of the game. 5-1 Vegas. Logan Couture's second on the power play makes it a 5-2 game. Timo Meers first of the playoffs makes it a 5-3 game. And then Mark Stone, his sixth of the playoffs, third of the game. He gets the hat trick, makes it a 6-3 Vegas lead. 
That's your final number one star of the game with three goals and two assists, Mark Stone. Number two star of the game with two goals and three assists, Paul Stasi. Number three star of the game with the goal and a six, Max Pacioretty. Tonight's playoff game, 7 o'clock NBCSN, the Bruins at the Maple Leafs. Toronto is a slight favorite in this game. Do I think they take a 2-1 series lead? No, because I think the loss of Nazem Kadri will hurt the secondary scoring of this team. And I think the Bruins like to play on the road. So give me Boston here to take a 2-1 series lead. 7 o'clock CNBC, Capitals, Hurricanes, the Canes are favored at home. I think the Canes get the win and get on the board in the series. 9.30 NBCSN, the Predators at the Stars. Dallas is the favorite team in this game, but I'm going to take the Predators here to get the win on the road. I just think they're the better team. 10 o'clock CNBC, the Flames at the Avalanche. Calgary is favored on the road. Kale McCarr making his NHL debut for the Avalanche. He was a lottery pick in 2017. He just finished up his college season playing in the Frozen Four with UMass, and I think he's going to come in and make an immediate impact. Me and John Butchacross discussed McCarr on the podcast last week and whether he would come in after the UMass season was over or not. And guess what? I think he'll come in, make an immediate impact. Colorado takes a 2-1 lead in the series. Some breaking NHL coaching news. The Flyers, literally just breaking news. The Flyers have hired former Rangers, Canucks, and Canadians coach Elaine Vigneault to be their next head coach. I'm surprised by this move. This is a young team with some veterans on it. I'm not sure if this is really the right fit. Vigneault did a good job with the Rangers in his first two seasons, and then as the team started trading away pieces and started to get younger, Vigneault was a little too disciplined, and the team just wasn't the right fit for him anymore. I'm interested to see how this would work. If I had the grade this hire, I'd say it's like a C. I just really don't love this hire. Because, like I said, there's a lot of young players on this team, and I think he's better with veteran latent teams rather than younger teams. Speaking of coaches, Luke Walton was let go by the Lakers. And now he's been hired by the Kings. And I think it's a good hire by Sacramento. I think Walton's a better coach than Dave Yeager. Obviously, the connection there is Vade Divac played with Walton on the Lakers in the mid-2000s. So this hire makes sense. I think he does a good job with young players. He walks into a situation with possibly three franchise players with Marvin Bagley, DeAndre Fox, and Buddy Heald. This could be the next great team, potentially, in the NBA, but they obviously need more pieces. They're in the West, so there's cases against it, but I do like this hire by the Sacramento Kings. And then the Lakers, meanwhile, looks like they are going to downgrade at head coach rather than upgrade the candidates there. Tyron Liu obviously was the head coach of the Cavaliers when they won the championship in 2016. I just think that he was a puppet there and overshadowed by LeBron. In Cleveland, I really wasn't a fan of him. Jawan Howard, who was a highly thought-out assistant with the Miami Heat, or I should say who is, he could be like a David Fisdale type of coach. And I think Fisdale would be the perfect fit for this Lakers team, but the Knicks snagged them last year. And then the other candidate is Monty Williams, who has been a coach in the NBA before. He obviously was with the Pelicans last, and then he ended up getting fired because he underachieved with Anthony Davis and a bunch of other players that they had. And I really think if I'm the Lakers, I wait and see what happens with some of these other teams that are in the playoffs right now that could potentially fire coaches. Like, for example... If Portland ends up losing this Oklahoma City series and they completely collapse within these next couple games, I wouldn't be floored if Terry Stotts is fired. I think Terry Stotts is a great NBA head coach. 
I think Billy Donovan, if Oklahoma City falters against Portland and loses the uh, three games against Portland and gets bounced, I think he could be let go. I think Donovan would be better than any of those three guys I listed. Although I do think LeGuan's a better coach than Billy Donovan. But Stotts, meanwhile, I think is a better coach than Luke Wall. And I think Stotts gets a lot out of his players. He works good with young guys. He works good with veterans. And they better hope Portland collapses these next couple games. Because I just think that's a very good fit. And there could be some random guys emerging. Because normally the guy that ends up getting a job is somebody that comes from nowhere. Like, you've seen that. A few years ago when Golden State fired Mark Jackson, everyone thought they were going to go after Mike D'Antoni or somebody else, but they ended up hiring Steve Kerr, who everybody thought was going to the Knicks a few years ago. Oh, Steve Kerr's career would be different if he ended up with Phil Jackson in New York. And it's going to be somebody weird that we're not expecting that's going to emerge and ends up getting the job. And who knows, Terry Stotts could be that. But if I'm the Lakers, I wait until after the first round, see who gets let go. I mean, I don't think Indiana will fire Nate McMillan because obviously the Ella Depot injury is what pretty much salvage or um, sabotage their season. But if say if they had Ella Depot and then lost in the first round, like Indiana normally doesn't fire coaches, but you never know. I thought that they were going to regret firing Frank Vogel, but I was proven wrong as Vogel was a failure in Orlando, and then McMillan has come in and done sensational as that team's head coach. So you never know what will happen, and I'm interested to see who the Lakers end up hiring. Now I'm going to go to baseball and go over those results real quick. I kind of got off topic because... This Flyers Elaine Vigneault news just broke and I had to get it off my chest a little bit. I'm just going to go over the results from baseball and look ahead to tonight a little bit. White Sox over the Yanks 5-2. Red Sox over the Orioles 4-0. Rays over the Blue Jays 8-4. Phils over the Marlins 3-1-14. Pirates over the Nats 4-3. Twins over the Tigers 6-4. Royals over the Indians 9-8. Rangers over the Yays 8-7. Cards over the Reds, 9-5. That game was in Mexico City. Rockies over the Giants, 4-0. Dodgers over the Brewers, 7-1. Diamondbacks over the Padres, 8-4. Astros over the Mariners, 3-2. Braves over the Mets, 7-3 on Sunday Night Baseball. Angels-Cubs was postponed due to weather. One game final already today. Orioles over the Red Sox, 8-1. That is just a very, very dismal loss for the Boston Red Sox. And a nice performance for the Orioles, who got a home run out of Chris Davis. We'll go over more of that game on tomorrow's podcast. Other games tonight, 7 o'clock on ESPN, you have the Mets at the Phillies, Noah Syndergaard and Aaron Nola. Syndergaard 1-1 with a 4.74, Nola 1-0 with a 6.46. Nola and Syndergaard are two studs. Both of them have been duds to start the season. And the team I think is going to get the win is the Philadelphia Phillies because they're home. And I think Bryce Harper, if I'm not mistaken, is on the Mets. So give me the Phillies at home. I'm going to say it's a high-scoring affair. I'm going to say it's 6-4. to four. Cubs, Marlins, Hugh Darvish, and Trevor Richards. Cardinals, Brewers, Dakota Hudson, and Freddie Peralta. Blue Jays Twins, Matt Schumacher and Martin Perez, Angels Rangers at 8 o'clock, Trevor Cahill and Shelby Miller. By the way, Blue Jays Twins is 740 as well as Cards Brews. Royals White Sox, Heath Fillmeyer and Irvin Santana. 10 o'clock ESPN, Reds Dodgers, Yasiel Puig and Matt Kemp's return to Los Angeles as well as Clayton Kershaw's season debut. He's going up against Luis Castillo. Rockies Padres, you have Joey Lachesi for San Diego, Colorado starters to be determined. And then, last but not least, the Indians at the Mariners, 
One big surprise against one so, sort of disappointment. Trevor Bauer against Yusei Kikuchi. Now I'm going to do my MLB power rankings. I'm going to go from 30 to 1 and say a little something about each and every team. 30 is the Marlins. They're obviously a team that's rebuilding. They're 4-12. and 12, And they're the worst team in the National League right now. 29 is the Kansas City Royals. Probably the worst team in the AL right now. They're not getting any good pitching. Meanwhile, Whit Merrifield is hitting well, despite the hitting streak coming to an end over the weekend. 28 is the Toronto Blue Jays. I'm disappointed in the Blue Jays. I thought they'd be a little bit more friskier to start the season with a soft schedule. They had the Orioles and the Tigers at home to start, but both of those teams have overachieved to their credit. 27, the Chicago White Sox. Yes, they just took... Two out of three in the Bronx against the Yankees, but the Yankees had half their team injured, so I really shouldn't put that much stock into that. I just don't think this team's very good. Their bullpen stinks. The rotation's okay. Carlos Rodon pitched well yesterday. Aloy Jimenez is going to be a stud. 26 is the Baltimore Orioles. Yes, they just had an impressive win in Fenway Park. Chris Davis finally homered, but they're still the Orioles, and they still stink. 25 is the Colorado Rockies. I think the most disappointing team in the big leagues, other than the Red Sox so far, has been Colorado. Their starting pitching outside of Herman Marquez has been suspect. They're not hitting. 24 is the Cincinnati Reds. They're playing a little bit better after their slow start. I wonder how Puig and Kemp get treated tonight in Los Angeles. 23 is the Chicago Cubs, the most disappointing team in the NL Central. You Darvish is not pitched up to the contract yet. Maybe he finally will tonight against the Marlins. 22 is the San Francisco Giants. They've overperformed a little bit so far. They won an 18-inning game against the Rockies recently. 21 is the Boston Red Sox. They get punished because they lost to the Orioles today, and they lost to them yesterday too, and getting Chris Davis out of his slump. Number 20 is the Texas Rangers. They are a team that I think has overachieved their 7-7. Seven and seven. Their starting pitching has been a little better than I expected. 19 is the Detroit Tigers. They're overachieving. Their starting pitching has been better than I thought. 18 is the Diamondbacks. They've been an overachiever so far. 17 is the Yankees. They're a bit of an underachiever. That's mainly due to injury and poor managing by Aaron Boone. I think they should have won two games in Houston, but they didn't. And... You can make a case they should have potentially won that White Sox game if Tanaka doesn't give up the Grand Slam. But, hey, it is what it is, and they just need their guys back or else this could be a year of hell for them. 16 is the Nationals. They're 500, but I'm not impressed with what I've seen so far. 15 is the Indians, a disappointing 8-7 and seven right now. Corey Kluber's been a dud. 14 is the Los Angeles Angels. They've been hot of late, although Mike Trout's hurt. 13 is the Pittsburgh Pirates. They've overperformed so far this year. Jameson Tyon's pitched well outside of one start. 12 is the Oakland Athletics. They have been flat out mashing, led by Chris Davis. Number 11 is the Minnesota Twins. They've exceeded my expectations so far. Byron Buxton's off to a good start. 10 is Los Angeles Dodgers. They're only one game over 500, but Cody Bellinger's been an absolute stud. Number 9 is the New York Mets. They're 9 and 6, which, let's face it, the Mets can take 9 and 6. They can afford that, and I'm sure they're happy with that. But I think it's disappointing that Jacob DeGrom, his last two starts, has been very bad for him. 8 is the Philadelphia Phillies. So far, they've looked like the best team in this division, although you can make a case for Atlanta, who I'm going to talk about next. Bryce Harper's off to a good start. Reese Hoskins is off to a good start, but who's not off to a good start is Aaron Nola, who needs to pitch well tonight on national TV. The Braves are number seven. After, after a slow start, they've rode the ship and are now in, a, in first place in the National League East. Ronald Acuna Jr. is just named the National League Player of the Week. Six is the St. Louis Cardinals. They're playing good ball right now. They swept the Dodgers last week, which was very impressive to me. Five is the San Diego Padres. I think the biggest surprise of the National League so far. They've been so good. When Manny Machado 
has brought some energy to that club. Their pitching's been very good. I'm fascinated to see where they are in a month from now. As far as the Milwaukee Brewers, they've been pretty good to start the year, led by their good bullpen and Christian Yelich and Mike Moustakas. Number three is the Seattle Mariners. I do not think that their 13-5 and start is real, as it was showed that they were swept by the best team in that division, which we'll get to in a second. And I got to say, though, Seattle has overperformed my expectations so far. Number two is the Tampa Bay Rays. They've been sensational. Austin Mathers was just named the American League Player of the Week. Blake Snell, after that bad start against the Astros on opening day, has pitched like Blake Snell from last year. And number one, no doubt about it, winners of eight straight games, the Houston Astros. They swept the Yankees. They swept the surprising Mariners. And they're looking like the team that everybody thought they'd be, which is the best team in baseball. Jose Altuve is an absolute stud. He carried them this week. He had the big grand slam against the Mariners. He single-handedly won them that Yankee series, in my mind. Because if he wasn't hot in that series, the Yankees probably win two games in that series. And my players of the week are two guys that didn't win their respective Players of the Week, and that's Altuve and Bellinger, who have both been off the red-hot starts this year. Bellinger's led the way for the Dodgers, and obviously Altuve I thought was a huge snub in the American League this week. Although Acuna, I was okay with the Acuna pick in the National League. And although Meadows had a good week, but the Astros have won eight straight games. Like, come on. And Jose Altuve was a big part of that. So, I kind of have a problem with Altuve not winning it, but it's all right. Whatever. It is what it is. Now we'll move on to the NFL mock draft. It's my 12th edition. The draft's in 10 days from now. And I made some changes to this mock draft, especially after the top seven. And I'm very fascinated to see how this plays out. Number one, Arizona Cardinals, Kyler Murray. Murray obviously has connections with Cliff Kingsbury, and this seems like the consensus pick right now on people's mock drafts. Number two is the San Francisco 49ers, Nick Bosa, defensive end, Ohio State. Bosa is somebody that's going to come in and be a game changer for San Francisco on their defense. He immediately becomes their best pass rusher. Three New York Jets, Josh Allen, defensive end, outside linebacker, Kentucky. Allen is somebody that could be a franchise guy, can absolutely change the Jets' defense and make it more look respectable. He's versatile, and the Jets need help on the defensive end. For the Oakland Raiders, Quentin Williams, defensive tackle, Alabama. Williams is somebody that can come in and be an impact player immediately. Think Aaron Donald. This would be a huge win for Gruden and Maycock. Five, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Devin White, inside linebacker, LSU. White is somebody that is fast and somebody that can come in and have a nice impact for Bruce Arians immediately. Six, the New York Giants, Montez Sweat, defensive end, outside linebacker, Mississippi State. You can argue it would be a massive mistake to pass on a quarterback in this draft for Big Blue, but reading the tea leaves, it looks like they'll go defense here. The Giants do need a pass rusher with the training of Olivier Vernon. Seven, Jacksonville Jaguars, J Jawan Taylor, offensive tackle, Florida. Taylor is somebody that has had his stock risen after a good combine. The Jags' offensive line is good, but Taylor would make it better. Eighth of the Detroit Lions, Grady Williams, cornerback, LSU. Williams is somebody that I think can be an immediate impact type of player in the, in the Lions secondary to go with Darius Slay. He's the best corner in the draft, and Matt Patricia would be happy with this pick. Nine, the Buffalo Bills, Ed Oliver, defensive tackle, Houston. Oliver was once projected a top five pick. His stock dropped after a subpar season at Houston. But he can come in to Buffalo and could potentially be an impact player for them. Ten, the Denver Broncos, Drew Locke. Quarterback, Missouri. There's some speculation that's growing and growing that the Broncos love Locke and they'll take him here. And 
He's somebody that could be their future franchise quarterback after Joe Flacco's contract runs out. 11 Cincinnati Bengals. Dwayne Haskins, quarterback, Ohio State. Yes, I did this. I was originally not buying the rumors of them looking at quarterback with the perception that they want to move on from Andy Dalton, but the more I think about it with the new coach, I think anything is possible here. And Haskins I'm a big fan of. He's a leader, and I think he could be a franchise quarterback. 12, Green Bay Packers. TJ Hokinson, tight end, Iowa. Jimmy Graham isn't the same player as he was as he was with the Saints, as the Green Bay Packers take Hokinson here to be his future replacement. He's drawn comparisons to George Kittle of the Niners. And I won't be surprised if Green Bay goes defense here, which, let's face it, they probably should. 13, Miami Dolphins. Rashawn Gary, defensive end, Michigan. Miami is a team that's all in on tank for Tua after it decided to sign Ryan Fitzpatrick and trade away Ryan Tannehill. Gary did not live up to expectations in college after he was the number one prospect in his class. 14, the Atlanta Falcons. Christian Wilkins, defensive tackle, Clemson. Wilkins is the first of three Clemson players to go. Guardy Jarrett is back with the Falcons, but Atlanta bolsters the unit by selecting Wilkins. 15, Washington Redskins. Daniel Jones, quarterback, Duke. Yes, everybody and their brother thinks that there's a great chance that he's drafted by the Giants because of his connections with the Manning Passing Academy and David Cutcliffe. But I could see the Redskins taking a chance on him, assuming that the Patriots or the Chargers or even the Giants trade for Josh Rosen. And Jones is somebody who had a good senior bowl, which has people buzzing. 16, the Carolina Panthers, Jonah Williams, offensive tackle, Alabama. The Panthers land a huge steal here at Williams, who I think is the best lineman in the draft. Cam Newton needs lineman in protection. 17, New York Giants from the Cleveland Browns. Cleveland Farrell, defensive end, Clemson. The Giants, you can make a case, need a pass rush as badly as they need a franchise quarterback. They have one of the worst pass rushes in the league with the trading of Vernon. And landing two pass rushers in the draft wouldn't be so bad for them. 18, Minnesota Vikings. Cody Ford, offensive tackle, Oklahoma. The Vikings, to me, have a look of a Super Bowl contender. As much as people want to point the finger at Kirk Cousins, the problem for Cousins is that he had a bad offensive line. I think Ford can come in and start for them immediately. 19, the Tennessee Titans. Brian Burns, defensive end, outside linebacker, Florida State. Burns could either go in the top 15 or slide entirely out of the first round. He's one of those types of players to me. He's somebody that can come in and, and dominate alongside Jarrell Casey in Nashville. 20, Pittsburgh Steelers. Byron Murphy, cornerback, Washington. Murphy falling this far would be a little bit of a steal for the Steelers. Yeah, they need a wide out to replace Antonio Brown, but... Defense, let alone secondary, wouldn't be a bad option either. 21, Seattle Seahawks. Nasir Adderley, safety, Delaware. Adderley's stock rose in light of a good senior bowl. He's not even considered the best safety in the draft, but I could see Pete Carroll being ballsy here. 22, the Baltimore Ravens. DK Metcalf, wide receiver, Ole Miss. Metcalf could be a steal from this spot, but the more important thing is that the Ravens need offensive weapons around Lamar Jackson to help his development. 23, Houston Texans. Dalton Risner, offensive tackle, Kansas State. The Texans had the offensive line that was the worst in the sport a year ago. They need a bunch of reinforcements. Risner would come in and step in immediately and have an impact. 24, the Oakland Raiders from the Chicago Bears. Devin Bush inside linebacker, Michigan. What a steal this is for John Gruden and company. Bush is someone that could theoretically go in the top 10 and landing him... This far back would be amazing. He would start immediately on this Raiders team that wants some youth on the defensive side of the ball. 25 Philadelphia Eagles, Dexter Lawrence, defensive tackle Clemson. Here's the third of the three Clemson guys that go off the board. Lawrence actually reminds me a lot of Fletcher Cox, so it would be funny to see those two on the same line for a little bit. 
26, Indianapolis Colts, Jerry Tillery, defensive tackle, Notre Dame. Tillery is someone that is very versatile and could slide into the new, young, emerging Colts core there in Indianapolis. 27, Oakland Raiders from the Dallas Cowboys, Josh Jacobs, running back, Alabama. The Raiders used their final first round there on a position of need at running back. Jacobs would be a nice weapon for Derek Carr as he would replace the old and washed up duo of Marshawn Lynch and Doug Martin. 28, Los Angeles Chargers, Jeffrey Simmons, defensive tackle, Mississippi State. Simmons is someone whose stock has dropped because of a torn ACL, but he can come in and play with Joey Bosa immediately along that defensive line. 29, Kansas City Chiefs, DeAndre Baker, cornerback, Georgia. Baker, I think, is one of the more underrated secondary players in the draft. He'd come in and start on this Chiefs secondary immediately because they literally don't have anybody good. 30, Green Bay Packers from the New Orleans Saints. Hakeem Butler, wide receiver, Iowa State. Butler's somebody that could either be a steal from this spot or just flat out flame out. To me, he's a hit or miss guy. He has a lot of speed, and he would slot well alongside Devontae Adams and Green Bay. 31, Los Angeles Rams. Garrett Brambury, center. North Carolina State, Bradbury is the best center in the draft. The Rams lose John Sullivan in free agency. Bradbury can start for the Rams immediately. 32, New England Patriots. Paris Campbell, wide receiver, Ohio State. One of Dwayne Haskins' primary targets go off the board here as he's drafted by the reigning Super Bowl champions. Campbell, somebody that has speed, and the Patriots can use a lot of speed right now on their offense with some of their off-season losses and some guys aging on that roster. That's it for the mock draft. Quickly before best bet, there's a rumor out there that Russell Wilson and his contract deadline was today. There's no contract. Now there's going to be rumors that are beginning already about the possibility that the Seahawks are going to let him go, whether that's outright or via trade. The New York Giants, to me, are a team that I think is interested, although they're not admitting it publicly. There's a reason why they may not be in love with any of these quarterbacks in this draft because they want to win. They're the New York Giants. They want to overtake the Jets. They want to shut up people in the media and the narrative of how Sam Darnold will have a better career than Saquon Barkley and all the things that is worrying people in the Giants, well, for me at least. And if Wilson gets traded to the Giants, I think the Giants have to give up two first-round picks, whether it's 6-17 and 17 this year or one of those two picks, plus their 2019 first-rounder, and maybe a couple second-round picks and maybe one more asset that's already on the team, like a Jabril Peppers, who they obviously got from the Browns in that Odell Beckham trade. But for me, this does not make the Giants an automatic playoff team like people in the media and their fans think. Because people think that Eli Manning is the sole problem on the Giants. He's the number one problem on that team, but he's not the only problem. The offensive line isn't is better than it's been with the addition of Kevin Zietler from the Cleveland Browns in the Vernon trade. And their offense is, on paper at least, is solid, even with the trading of Odell Beckham Jr. And I'm obviously against the Odell trade, and I think the Giants should have gotten more or should have convinced San Francisco to give up the number two pick. But... It is what it is, and if they turn Odell Beckham Jr. into Russell Wilson, I think some Giants fans would actually take that because, let's face it, quarterback's the most important position in sports. Russell Wilson is a top-five quarterback in this sport. He does a lot with less. But my other argument about this whole him going to the Giants narrative, this doesn't make them an automatic playoff team because their defense is so bad. It's probably the worst in the league right now with all these tradings and some of the moves that they've done with letting go of Landon Collins and Olivier Vernon. So, to me, this probably takes the Giants from a 3-4 win team to a 500 team 
at best for me. And let's face it, that's to me with the Seahawks. That's the same range the Seahawks have right now. I just think the Seahawks grossly overachieved last year because they have a great coach in Pete Carroll, and they obviously have Wilson. And Pat Shermer is not as nearly as good as a coach as Pete Carroll. Now on to my best bet of the day, brought to you by DraftKings. My best bet from the other day did not work out. I forgot who lost. I think it was the Yankees against the White Sox. So without further ado, here we go. I'm going to take the San Diego Padres. Yes, I did just say that. The Philadelphia Phillies. The Minnesota Twins, the Philadelphia 76ers, and the Golden State Warriors. That's a little under six to one. I'm weighing a dollar with a pad of six dollars and eighty-eight cents. That's it for the podcast today. I'll be back tomorrow with more discussion of the NBA and Stanley Cup playoffs, baseball as well. I'm going to do an NBA mock draft tomorrow. With the lottery a few weeks away. And later on in the week, I'm going to have some guests on the podcast to do some NBA playoff chatter. And also I'm going to do a grade A NFL mock draft of what each team should do. Similar to what ESPN's Todd McShay and Mel Kiper Jr. did last week. And I hope you guys have a great day, everybody.